to use your imagination, but it's a really interesting thing. You're standing over the top of an archaeological excavation. It's right below our feet. Now, if you want to see it, you have to go into that museum right there, which is actually quite pricey. There's some cool things in there, but it's not on our itinerary because it will take valuable time away from things that we could see that would actually be more valuable, except for what's under our feet. This structure here is built over, it was just an abandoned structure, and archaeologists started digging in here a number of years ago, and I actually passing by on the ramparts, you could hear all the, the digging and see the work lights and all of that. Under our feet, the archaeologists discovered the northwest corner of King Herod the Great's palace. Now, that may not mean anything to you, and it might not exactly rot your socks off, but I gotta, I gotta tell you something about this palace. And I have to get a picture here that I need to bring up just a second because I'll show you um, an example of what we're looking at here. Now, King Herod the Great's palace was huge. He built it for himself and it was two-sided. Come in real close. You got to see this. I don't even know if you can. It might not be, it may be too bright. But can you guys see this picture? Okay, can, why don't you move your head so they can see. Okay, here's part of the palace here, part of the palace over here. Can you guys see this? Okay, so the palace has two sides to it. This is a big model of it that's over at the Israel Museum. Can you guys see this? That's a model of it. Okay, now, here's, what it, here's the deal with the palace. The palace had two identical sides. It was like a mirror image of itself, so that you had one large structure which started right about the middle of this area we're talking, uh, we're talking from here, and the corner is over here, and then it went way out over there by that wall and down, probably over by that building that you can see over there with the roundish windows and back. It was a large square structure. Herod the Great built that side for himself. Then there was a large garden in the middle with a fountain right in the middle. The entrance into the palace area was over there on that side, pretty much even with that wall, and it went out. Okay, in and out if you wanted to come in. Simple enough. Then there was another palace exactly like this one on the other side. So in other words, if you folded his palace structure like this, it would, be, it would fold up like a book like a mirror image of itself. One half is exactly the same as the other. So far so good? Have you got it? Mm -hmm. Now, this was also a fortress. This area here was, and still is, the highest level in the old city of Jerusalem. This is the highest point. You say, no, that's a Temple Mount. Not even. This is the highest point. So Herod, being a paranoid, built this like the strongest fortress in Jerusalem besides the Temple Mount. If you look at the temple and the way it was constructed, Herod's temple, it was built like a massive fortress. And it actually acted as such uh, what, during the siege of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, it was burned. 7,000 people were incinerated within its courts when it burned. But this area here was a massive fortress. Big walls here. A big wall going all the way around this thing. Over here, you see the people on top over there? Okay, this is a rather new addition to a very, very old structure. You, the further down you go, the older it gets. At the bottom, it's modified by the Crusaders. It's got one of those glacious walls where it kind of, like you saw at Caesarea, where it slopes. But it's made out of old Herodian stones. And you can tell if you know what you're looking at, they're Herodian. At the end of this fortress of Herod's, there were three towers. You see how tall that tower is there? That's about 60 feet tall. Herod had three towers. He named them, he named them Faziel, Hippicus, and Miriamne. The tallest one was 137 feet tall. That structure's 60 feet. So he had three towers guarding this end of, of his palace. And inside those tower area, that tower area there, I don't know what else was there, but they did find one thing. Herod liked to swim. They found another swimming pool. So that was up in that area. Now Herod's palace was here. What makes this important? After Herod the Great died, the Romans pretty much called eminent domain. And when Roman governors 
from Caesarea, which was their headquarters, came here during the Passover because they would, Roman governors would often come up here during the Passover. They would lodge in this end of the palace, this part right here. It became the governor's mansion while they were in Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate, when he came up for the Passover, came here. The Bible tells us that when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, where you just were, the, 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 the soldiers that were temple soldiers, by the way, not Roman soldiers, that dragged him back down the Kidron Valley and probably up back through the Essene Gate where he had actually exited. We'll see where that approximately was in just a little while. And then to Annas' house, to Caiaphas' house, and then eventually to where Pontius Pilate was staying. If you've ever wondered about where Pontius Pilate was staying, we would say that he was staying at the Antonia Fortress, which is at the northwest corner of the Temple Mount way over there. Except the Bible says he was staying at the palace. Those are the words in the Bible. Josephus said he stayed at the palace. You're standing on top of the palace. It's underground, the ruins are there. You really have to work your imaginations to see this. But here's where it gets very interesting. Jesus is brought to Pilate here. It's Passover, so the Jewish leadership won't defile themselves by coming inside the courtyards to meet with Pilate in front of his house or at his house because he's a Gentile. The place is crawling with Gentiles. The place is crawling with Praetorian guards. Praetorian guards, remember, they're the elite like bodyguard, the elite soldiers that traveled with the governor. There was a praetorium down in Caesarea. We went to that and we read about, you know, Paul appealed to Caesar and that was the praetorium. Don't forget that the praetorium is mobile. Wherever the governor is, the praetorium is there. So here in Jerusalem, the praetorium was here. The Antonia Fortress was a barracks for the legions that were here. Pilate is here with the praetorium. The, pi the palace has everything. The palace has regal royal quarters all the way down to dungeons and places to torture people. That's the way palaces were built. Pilate is here. The Jews will not come in here. Jesus is brought to Pilate. They start very early in the morning. That was normal. They didn't give Pilate a special wake-up call. And he's brought to Pilate here. Pilate questions him. And then it tells us that Pilate took Jesus and presented him before the Jews at the quote unquote, now don't overlook this, the judgment seat. The judgment seat went by another name. It was called a bema. Heard of the bema seat? We say that, you know, when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he refers to the reward seat of Christ and he calls it the bema seat because they had this thing in Corinth. They had this thing all over the Roman world. Wherever Roman justice was meted out by an official, there was a bema. It was a raised platform, probably about eight feet tall. It was wide. It was highly decorated to represent the, the majesty of Rome and the power of Rome. And the magistrate or the governor would come out onto this thing, and then he would render whatever decisions needed to be made at that time. So you have a bema. There was a bema here. Jesus was put out on that bema. Now the question is, where do you find a bema? Nobody's dug one up in Jerusalem. You'd have to dig up half the city to find it. However, by the observations, once again, of historians, historians, and they got it right with the great model of Jerusalem over at the, uh, at the Israel Museum, there was right about where that building is right there that you see with the, with the three windows in it right there in a row, with this, okay, in that area. In that section right over there, there was a marketplace, a large marketplace, a colonnaded marketplace that's in a very wealthy neighborhood. This whole neighborhood in this area was for priests, priestly families, high priests, that sort of thing. This is where the rich people lived, the elite people lived, right in this area all the way down to Mount Zion along this ridge. And there was this wide open marketplace. If you see the great model of Jerusalem, you can see the marketplace clearly attached right to the exit of the palace. If you want to find a Bema seat in the ancient world, find the marketplace. Find the marketplace. I've been to Philippi. Guess where the Bema was? Right in the marketplace. Been to Corinth. Where's the Bema? In the marketplace. You go to Athens. Where's the Bema? In the marketplace. And so forth and so on. All around the Greco-Roman world, if you want a judgment seat, you're going to find it in the marketplace. Where was Jesus put on trial? 
You're standing on where he met with Pilate. Where was Jesus presented before the people? On the judgment seat, on the bema. Probably right over there. So when Jesus was flogged, he was flogged under your feet, somewhere in this vicinity. This is where Jesus was scourged here, and then brought out to the bema, out there in front of a wide open area where you have early in the morning all the Jewish leadership and the rabble that they managed to gather together shouting, crucify him, crucify him. The reason I emphasize him is because he gave him a choice between him and Barabbas. Crucify him. And it happened over in this area here. That's where Jesus was presented before the people. So now you're seeing where all of this happened. Now there's something else. Remember Jesus was sent at one point over to Herod Antipas. So Jesus, you know, uh, here, um, um, Pilate learns that Jesus is a Galilean. Ah, oh, let's give him to Herod Antipas. He throws Herod Antipas a bone. It's not like passing him off. It's, they didn't get along. But if he sends Jesus to Herod Antipas, it means that Pilate, the governor, is recognizing Herod's right to rule. And they didn't like each other, but him sending Jesus over made them friends. It didn't make them enemies because Pilate was mocking him. It was something that Antipas really respected. Where was Herod Antipas? Some say he was at the old Hasmonean palace, which was somewhere way over there. But it's possible he was at the other end, at the other palace right here. They took Jesus right across the courtyard. Pil uh, Antipas talks with him for about an hour, is bored because Jesus won't even speak to him, much less do anything, and he sends him back here to Pilate. Finally, Jesus is flogged, with the, he's scourged, and then he's given his cross piece, not the whole cross. Ronnie will tell you all about this in a few days. It's a brilliant talk that he does. And over here, in this area, right over there at the judgment seat, Jesus takes the cross and begins to carry it towards Calvary. This discovery that you're standing on, it's under here, rewrote the entire location of Jesus' crucifixion, his trial, the whole nine yards. It most likely happened right under your feet and in this area right here. There's one more thing, and then we'll take our walk down the ramparts to the Zion Gate and go see the upper room. But here's the one more thing you need to remember. Herod the Great did live here. And since this was his palace, a thing happened before Herod the Great died. Some guys way over in the area of Persia saw this strange little star in the sky and said, Oh, we have some old scrolls that say that portends the coming of some sort of a Jewish Messiah. He will be a king. Let's seek him out. And they come into the land, and where does the Bible say they went? To see Herod the Great at his palace. You're standing over the spot, the place, where the wise men met with Herod and said, where is the king? It's right here. You look around, there's nothing to see. It's all underground. And it hasn't been dug up except for this one little section. I wonder what they'd find if they dug up all the rest of this, including that bema. What a fascinating thing. But I wanted to bring you here because that whole thing of the marketplace there, it's historical, it's written down, it's been modeled by people who have done tremendous research and they say it was there. But I have yet to hear anybody connect the dots and say a bema would have been in the marketplace and the governor's mansion was right next to a bema wherever it was. Hmm. So now you know. I hope that paints a whole new picture for you with the Bible. And then Jesus carried the cross out this way, down the hill. Chances are, the you're going to see the traditional Via Dolorosa. Chances are that the real Via Dolorosa goes down a road that's right in this area here where you can actually walk on just a street. Just a street. So what? And then down the what they call the Arab Bazaar. King David Street, all the way to the bottom and then to the left and out of the city. That's probably where he carried the cross. Nobody even commemorates it there. But if this was Herod's palace, and it was, Pilate was here, the trial was here, Jesus was here, Jesus was flogged here, Jesus was given his cross here, and he carried it out from here over to Calvary. All right, let's go.